Well, hello and welcome to this edition of the EV Revolution Show. My name is Kenneth Bocor. Happy 2019. Thanks for tuning in for my first show of the year. Hopefully everybody had a good holidays and you enjoyed both the Christmas show and the New Year show as we still had some information to pass on. So uh, thanks for watching in. Let me get right into a few subjects that I'm following here for episode 25. Now, the first article that I picked up is a little bit of a different story. I always... Well, I try to bring in the environmental aspect, obviously, of what I'm doing to the different stories and to the shows. And there was an article that came out from Clean Technic a little while ago about Costa Rica. Now, Costa Rica, if you're not aware, is a gorgeous country. I, I've not been there, but I know people who have. Uh, everybody who goes there says it's a very beautiful country, ecologically friendly, and uh, I'm very forward thinking from that perspective. Well, they're, they're a country that's basically on the brink of the EV revolution. And what, what does this article say and what do we, I mean when I say that? Well, basically, Costa Rica is a small South American country and they're very reliant on oil-based energy for uh, for its heating and, and or, well, cooling and everything else that it does from that pers perspective, especially in the transportation sector where um, oil accounts for about 70% of the consumption base for cars. So that's both consumer and commercial transportation. So trucks and vans and automobiles and things like that. So they started some programs like electric buses. So for the commercial side, for some of the cities and towns uh, that can support it, they're pi piloting electric, fully electric buses for intercity transport. So in addition to that, diesel trucks and delivery vans and things like that are great for, for any type of hauling uh, transportation environment, are great for electrification. And there are, I've, I've shown models on the show of, of different kinds of cars and trucks that companies are buying to do that. So that's a prime sector. If we look at climate for a quick sec, they have a very tropical climate, but their average temperature is about 25 degrees Celsius. And that's actually a great temperature for supporting optimal battery range. Now, Costa Rica is also not a huge country, so they have relatively shorter travel distances to, to deal with within the country. And in fact, 92% of the population in Costa Rica lives in single family homes that all have easy access to electricity. So I've talked about on many shows that the, the bulk of charging that is done for all electric vehicles or even plug-in hybrid vehicles by consumers is at home. If, you know, your home is your gas, your garage or your home is your gas station, as I've said many times. So with with Costa Rica having uh, that type of demographics and that, that type of environment with single family homes as well, it's an ID can, uh, ideal candidate as well to look at private electric vehicles. So um, now one of the, the barriers to adoption though, and, and I've talked about this before, is price. And we know that cost parity is eventually coming and such, but in Costa Rica and other countries as well, it can be very tough. Um, the average per capita income is only about $10,000. And I'm guessing this is a US number. It didn't say in the article. Um, compared to the high cost of EVs, which in Costa Rica could 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 start at fifty thousand dollars, so it's a, it's a huge de difference um, and delta in looking to spur EV adoption. So in late two thousand and seventeen, the government got behind the move, and they've put in uh, legislation to exempt new and used EVs as well. And used is a key one from sales, customs, and consumption taxes, which equals about 24% uh, or so of being able to reduce the cost of the EVs by taking all that away, those incentives. Now, the government also set a goal in Costa Rica of 37,000 EVs on the road by 2022. Well, that's only about three years away, folks, so not very not very uh, long. Now, in a, in a country where sales of new cars and light trucks average about 50,000 per year, that's a pretty tall order. It's about 20% to reach that goal. Uh, it seems right now they are well on their way to doing that uh, based on the Ionic, uh, the Hyundai Ionic Electric is one of the most popular battery electric vehicles in Costa Rica. And um, it starts at a very competitive $34,000 US and you can get into used Nissan lease for about uh, 11 to 17,000 and so forth. So there are certainly things that are going on. Now I mentioned infrastructure and rapid charging. Costa Rica is in the process now of implementing a robust rapid charging infrastructure. They plan for 28 level three chargers to be opened um, by the end of this year, 2019. They've already got a few open that started last fall. Government, municipal, some other offices as well are going to be deploying level two chargers that are free for public use to support adoption as well. So this is a great story, just taking a step back and looking at it, folks. Now, I know Costa Rica is a small country, but you know if they can do it, others can do it 
it too. It doesn't really matter much on size. So, you know, I think the key here is when you have the government and you have its people committing to EV transition, like it's happened in Norway. We all know that Norway is way ahead of the ball game when it comes to EV adoption. The transformation can come at a very, very high speed. And I think that that's, this article states that the, they predict that that's what will happen in order to, um, you know, maintaining some sort of sustainable environment and protecting uh, what they have down there lowering their greenhouse gas emissions so good on costa rica i wasn't sure if you were aware of what's going on but it's a great example of uh, when things do work and when people in government align good things can happen well, I switch gears and get on the topic of global sales. Now, I don't have December numbers, but uh, I do have a couple of articles that talk about numbers of EVs uh, worldwide. I tend to focus more on worldwide. There's a lot of websites and articles that just talk about U.S. sales and maybe European sales, but I like to look at everything globally except for China. I do leave China out of my mix when it comes to reporting. Um, however, I believe China is included into these global numbers, so I do need to account for them. Uh, but there was a new record set in November for uh, of over 237,000 electric cars that were sold in the month of uh, of November, and that includes all electric and plug-in hybrid electric vehicles. Um, if December brings at least 272,000 or so, which it should based on historical figures, uh, we should see total sales in 2018 of about 2 million, and that's about 2% of the market share, which I've mentioned on a couple of shows before. Um, so that's fantastic. And just to, um, just to put some of that in perspective, um, these the cars that were sold last month, that was up 73% from year over year. And more than two thirds of those were 67% were all electric vehicles. So we've, I've talked about this and I know when Trevor and I were, were doing the show, we talked about the, the switch from initially hybrid or battery plug-in uh, hybrid electric vehicles and um, all electric only battery vehicles. Uh, you know, you had higher sales here and lower sales for all electric. And now we've seen that switch. We've seen that, that crossing point and that switch where now we're seeing more than two thirds are battery electric vehicles and that's why well costs are slightly coming down and incentives are still in place in most cases um, uh, ranges are getting better you're getting bit, uh, bigger battery packs you're getting some you know you're getting more choice out there in the industry uh, hatchbacks sedans suvs so forth so that's starting to appeal to more and more people that they can look at bringing in an electric vehicle into their use case and their lifestyle. What was the biggest model? Well, obviously the Model 3. Uh, it took the, the cake and, and I, I know December's numbers were just came out, so I didn't add it to here, but they were um, well over 120,000 at the end of November for sales. So they should be around 140,000, 150,000, I think is the number 147 or so for the year for the Model 3. So as a single model sales perspective, that takes the cake. From that, um, other noteworthy ones in the top th three or four, um, Nissan Leaf was second for worldwide sales with, with uh, just under 83,000 so far year to date. That's not including this December, so I expect them to get into 80, 85 to 90,000 range, something like that. Um, a Chinese uh, BAIC EC series was number three at 82,000 and change. Uh, Tesla Model S was number four and the Model X was number seven. And that rounds out actual, uh, you know, the top few of battery electric vehicles within the global sales. Other noteworthies, when I look at non-Tesla and Leaf as an example or Chinese models, um, the Mitsubishi Outlander actually did very well for, you know, really kind of the, the PHEV for coming out fairly late in the year, or later in the year, uh, with uh, about 38,000 at the end of November. Uh, the Renault Zoe had about 35,000 and the BMW i3. Now, I don't know if uh, that's a, probably a combination number of both the Rex and the non-Rex version, but it came out at around 30,000 so far at the end of November. So a little bit more for the year. Interesting. Don't see the Chevy Bolt. Don't see the Chevy Volt. Uh, don't see the Ionic in that mix. Um, there's don't see the e-Golf. Uh, don't see some other vehicles in that mix from a global perspective. So, you know, they may be selling in certain markets, but I always try to look at a global. Now, I wanted to also bring in some numbers for Canada because I did get some Canadian numbers as well. Um, even with our incentives going away, Ontario, it's still been a great year for Canada. And at the end of, of a Q3, we were at just under 35,000 EVs uh, sold in Canada, with, of course, the number one being the Model 3, sounding like a broken record, but also the Nissan Leaf was number two and the Chevy Bolt B with a, that's a B as in Bob with a Bolt. 
for the bolt was the number three. I don't have the independent numbers on there. Uh, but again, it's good to see. I expect that number to climb in the fourth quarter of this year to be well over probably for, closer to 40,000 anyway, if not a little bit more, primarily from Ontario, Quebec, and British Columbia, which are the provinces right now that still have, well, Ontario had incentives up until July, uh, but there's still momentum and a lot of infrastructure, a lot of things going on here in Ontario to keep people buying. Uh, so that's all good, and I'm glad that Canada is participating in the global growth. I talked, I think, on the last show or, or a couple of shows ago about the Chatham growth and continued adoption of Chatham charging and, and, and continued charging growth there. But also CCS continues to grow. There's an article that came out that uh, CCS uh, has almost about 6,000 DC fast chargers in Europe, which is probably more than you may think is there because I do get comments and emails once in a while. I talk to people that uh, are, are just saying, gee, you know, this all this Chatham stuff, but I don't see a lot of CCS. I mean, typically, at least in, in, in the UK and other places in Europe, when the chargers are built, they're usually dual station chargers. So you'll get a CCS and you'll get a Chatham within the same charger. Uh, but some some maybe not. But there's, a, you know, again, good news that it's about 6,000 that are in Europe. They, and they continue to be built uh, on a very large frequency. Most of those are 20 to 50 kilowatt chargers. But of course, I've talked about some of the Fastnet and some of these other guys that are coming out with 100, 175, and even 350 kilowatt chargers that are moving. Now, what's the top five countries uh, for CCS combo? chargers installed anybody take a guess take your guess okay well i'll tell you what it is the number one is germany at just under 1500 the uk at just over 1100 norway is third with 548 france is 544 so barely in fourth place just below norway and sweden rounds out the top five at 367 uh, and you can go online and check how many are in your prospective country just look for the article and uh, you'll find it out. But it's, again, good to see that continued growth. And that's just going to continue into this year, into 2019, as we see more expansion in Europe, um, in Asia Pac, in North America as well, in some of these other countries. Talk about Tesla, I believe on the last show, just wanted to round out with some more news. As of today, I just saw an article that the Model 3 orders are now open to general public in Europe and China. So there's been some, uh, uh, I guess, you know, Either pre-orders for uh, for reservationists, obviously, to to start ordering, but now it's open to the general public. So the Model Three is ready to order in 14 uh, European countries. Now, remember, these are left-hand drive countries or left-hand drive models for those countries. So sorry, uh, England, UK, you're going to have to wait a little longer. Uh, but it's coming, it's coming. So uh, I've got this chart behind me that shows you where the Tesla Model 3 is available from a left-hand drive configuration. Obviously in North America, it's been here for some time, but uh, now you'll see these countries in Europe that uh, you can order, go online to the configure and now put your order in for Model 3. I don't know what um, expectation is are for delivery, but since Tesla is cranking these out as fast as uh, ever now um, at over 7,000 a month, if my if I me my memory serves me correct. Last time I heard, uh, I would expect a three to six week delivery, but uh, check with Tesla directly, of course, to find that out. But that's good news. And I know there's a lot of people that are anxiously waiting to start ordering their Model 3. So now, um, not only from a reservationist perspective, but from if you don't have a reservation, you can now go ahead and order one. And again, you'll be able to get one. So we'll and we'll see how sales go. But I expect uh, sales to be very brisk in Europe for the Model 3. Now, before I get to my mailbag, I have a little mailbag segment today. Um, I wanted to just quickly take a step back and talk about give you kind of a quick update on my Nissan Leaf because um, I ran some numbers over holidays or by the end of the year. But before I do that, I did want to just kind of apologize a little bit. So I was on uh, some of the websites and I always read some of the comments and I go into forums and stuff to look for information and talk to people that way. And I know I've been saying for quite some time that uh, we expect or that uh, I'm not surprised to see the numbers in the Model 3 deliveries uh, because of all the back orders that Tesla has. They have all these back orders to fill. So even the, these la the last record month that they've had, uh, November and into December now, um, I, I've been saying that it's not, a, not to be surprised because the majority of these should be just filling reservations because they have these back orders. Well, I was corrected and I want to I want to do a shout out to Inside EVs because I love that website and I talked to many of the folks there, especially to Stephen Loveday. He's a great guy. I don't know him personally, but I just, you know, we, we interact a little bit uh, virtually through uh, cyberspace. But he corrected me on, on some comments that I made and I wanted to just correct myself as well because I, 
I, I, you know, sometimes I get some flack for people thinking that I'm not objective and I'm either pro Nissan and not a, a, an anti Tesla or pro Tesla and anti this, whatever. I'm not. I try to be objective as much as I can, folks. So I just want to let you know um, that I was uh, corrected that the last uh, record numbers that we've seen for the Model 3 for December, November, December, the majority of those were new sales. So about 25% or so, 25 to 30% were were deliveries for reservationists, not the other way around. So the vast majority was, was new orders coming into the system. Uh, and that's fantastic for Tesla because it just it shows that uh, they don't only have a business model for filling the back orders that they have to deal with, but they've got a majority of buyers that are coming in off the street, seeing Model 3s, hearing the reviews, watching all these hundreds of videos now on the Model 3. You, can, you can't shake a stick without hitting a Model 3 these days. Um, there's lots of information out there, so people are getting it bandered, uh, admired by it, and looking to buy, and they're able to get one in three to six weeks kind of thing now, so because they're rolling off the lines. So, um, based on that, that's excellent prospects for Tesla, um, and if you are a financial analyst, you should definitely be looking at that as part of your equation to see how they're going to do moving forward. But uh, so they have a long way to go on reservations. If they make about 150,000 this this calendar year, and you know even if 40 percent are towards reservation, um, they've got a long way to go because there was around four to five hundred thousand reservations, including right-hand drive models, like in countries like uh, UK and Australia. So we have to factor that in. That availability is not there yet. So the point is, it's great to see, and I thank, I thank Stephen for correcting me on that. So uh, I am now surprised to see those numbers, especially if they're new orders, which they are, the majority are. So that's quite surprising to me. Um, so I'll have to uh, stop saying that I'm surprised anymore about these numbers and give uh, Tesla the due credit that I do give them anyway. I know they're doing a great job. So thank you anyway, Stephen, and thanks for people that uh, I do read comments and I do respond to emails and stuff, and I do understand where people want to correct me, and I appreciate that very much. All right, so I mentioned a little bit of information about my leaf, and let me get back to that for a sec. So um, here's a quick chart that I'll put up behind me, and I'll, I'll kind of explain this. What I've done is I've, I've put together a quick spreadsheet just based on um, the energy that I've used to drive the car. Now I got my Nissan Leaf in mid-May of, of 2018. It only had 25 kilometers on it. So it literally was off the truck into the dealer parking lot, you know, from the rail depot into the dealer parking lot and sat there basically or was ready for, for getting ready for my delivery pickup. Um, and so I've had it since new, obviously, and I've, I've tracked my mileage um, and, and I've showed on my two month review video. If you go back and look at that, I showed you pictures of the Nissan Connect app, which does a pretty good job at, at obviously tracking every kilometer you drive and some statistics around that, like energy used and all that good stuff. So this spreadsheet that I have behind me here, uh, I put together my, my uh, kilometers driven with the net energy used to drive those kilometers. And that there's a little bit of a gray area there because what the Nissan app does is it, it takes your, um, you know, how much energy you use to drive the car and it takes off any regenerative braking energy that you make as well while you're driving and then it calculates a net number basically from that. So, uh, and that could be a little off here and there, but I'm going to use that as my basis for the calculation. So, and then I've also kept track of my DC fast charged. I've only charged about four uh, times, uh, I think four or five times throughout all of 2018. So I kept track of the cost and how much I've charged for, was how, how much energy that I used at the DC fast chargers. Uh, and then of course I've got all my costs there and, uh, and some other things like my CO2 savings and, and all that. So to summarize all these numbers that are behind me, I, have, I drove just under 15,000 kilometers for from May to the end of December of 2018. Um, I used about 2,200 or so um, kilowatt hours of energy uh, along with um, 90, plus 90, so about 200, uh, 2,321 is the number there. So let's say 2,325. Um, kilowatt hours of energy to drive that 15, just under 15,000, you know, 14, 8, 7, 9 kilometers. The cost, now let me get to the cost for a sec because I've had some people say, ah, oh, your cost of Bologna from that last video, where you're bonkers, what's going on? Well, so I only charge my car off peak. I never charge it during the day because I never have to. 
uh, if I'm home, obviously, if I'm out at a mall or, or a venue that has free charging, hey, I'll plug it in, I'll use it if I need it, of course. Um, but for, for my, my routine charging that I do when I need to, I charge at home and I charge off peak hours. So here in Ontario, we have tiered pricing. It's more expensive during the day and it's less expensive at other times within a 24 hour cycle. Between seven at night and seven in the morning, it's the cheapest rate for, for us and for me and my municipality through my, my electricity provider, it's 6.5 cents per kilowatt. That's 6.5 cents Canadian per kilowatt for power between the off-peak hours. So that's when I, I charge my Nissan LEAF because I set it, I have the timer and all that good stuff. So on top of that, some people have said, well, you know, it's, you can't just go by six and a half cents because you've got other fees. And you're absolutely right. I've got delivery fees in there. Um, I've got um, a regulatory charge that they stick on us. Um, and of course, our taxes, which we all have to pay. So I've gone through my electricity bill uh, the last couple, and I've been able to extrapolate what that what those numbers are. And when I add in the rest of those numbers, it takes it to about 12.5 cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, if I look at that. So 12.5 um, cents per kilowatt hour to all in to charge my leaf is a very, very fair and accurate number. So when I look at my home charging costs, based on all the energy that I've used that I told you earlier, that came out to about $279 Canadian. Uh, plus, if I look at the DC fast charging, where I've charged a few times and some of the energy I've, that I've got from there, that came to about $88. So obviously, it's still fairly expensive to fast charge here. So that gave me a total of $367 and change Canadian. So the summary of that is for me to drive 14,879 kilometers, you can do the conversion to miles and, and you figure out what that is. It cost me about $367 Canadian to do that. When I factor that into one of our other cars, so one of our small compact sedans that we have here, a little four cylinder 1.8 Nissan, how much it, the fuel average fuel costs and how much it would do to how much it would cost to do that kind of kilometers based on Phillips, it would be about eleven hundred dollars Canadian, eleven to twelve hundred dollars Canadian, uh, roughly on fuel. Pro probably a little bit more. I might be a little conservative on that, but I'll leave it at that. So let's say eleven hundred. So. You know, I paid three hundred, almost less than four hundred dollars Canadian, and I, instead of paying about eleven hundred dollars on fossil fuel, um, so four hundred for the electricity. So there's a savings. Plus, uh, as you can see in the chart, I've uh, not put in or contributed about two hundred seven, two thousand seven hundred nine. Uh, kilograms of CO2 that I've not emitted to the atmosphere. So I've saved the atmosphere from that. And then there's my average economy. So far, I'm averaging about 6.7 kilometers per kilowatt hour. And the only other expenses I had was getting my set of winter tires, which I talked about on an earlier episode a few few shows ago. I ended up buying a full set of uh, Michelin uh, XI3 snow tires. Uh, steel rims as well. These are 16 inch uh, rims and tires. Uh, the sensors to go with them, I had them installed, balanced, and then I had my uh, existing factory rims and tires put into the dealer storage because I don't have enough room here to store more tires. So all that cost me about just under $1,600 Canadian with tax in and all this kind of stuff. So that was my only expense, if you want to call it, because I also had a 12,000 kilometer service checkup, which cost me nothing. It was a free checkup. Uh, and all they do is they, they gave me a battery report. Obviously, they plugged it in and, and told me I'm a battery. It was fine. And they did visual checks and the usual stuff that they do. is not much to really do on the Nissan uh, or on, on a BEV, as, as you folks know. So, so uh, that was my total expenses, uh, and I don't really count those in because I had to get, you know, I'm big on a set of uh, separate set of tires up here when we get snow and ice. So I'm a big believer in having that, and that's a one-time expense. Probably those tires should last me four to five years anyway, depending on the on the kilometers that I do. We've and we've had a very light winter so far, so we'll see. Um, and then uh, I've also have a column. I've been I've been trying to keep track of my average range when I start the car in the morning. So after a full charge, what does the gasometer or the GOM on the Nissan LEAF say? What is it? What does it tell me on the dashboard? Now I have Leaf Spy Pro so I can get a bit more accuracy to the actual state of charge and state of health of the battery. But you're just going by the, the what Nissan puts on the dash from a battery percentage perspective and a range. Um, I started when I first got the car, it was at 300 kilometer ranges, uh, and that was in May. Throughout the, the spring and summer time, and these are 
these are guesses because I wasn't tracking it that much. I'm just kind of going by memory. You know, I was anywhere from 285 to 290 kilometers as a starting range in the nice summer temps. Um, and then I'm starting to see some of the range drop. So in September, averaging maybe a startup range of about 270 or so, and then October 250 kilometers down to what I'm what I saw in December of about 235-ish or so when I start up in the morning with temperatures in my garage at about four or five degrees Celsius. It doesn't get frozen, doesn't get below uh, negative Celsius temperatures in my garage because we have it's insulated a bit, so it does keep it above freezing, uh, but it can get down to about four or five degrees uh, Celsius in the garage where it's parked. So as you can see, the range that I've been tracking is fairly consistent to what we should expect from summer to winter temperatures, 20 to 30, even it can be even up to 50% range drop, but I seem to be right in that sweet spot based on the starting ranges because I had a few people email me saying, hey, what kind of range are you getting now that it's getting colder? So I'll continue to to monitor kind of my average range throughout the month. We, we should get colder temperatures now that we're into January and February, but it's been up and down like a yo-yo so far here, folks. You know, from minus four one day to plus eight the next, it's pretty, pretty uh, weird winter we're happening here in Canada. But we'll see. So hopefully that's a value information. But again, the, the the main thrust of this was to just to show you that this is my actual numbers, and I drive normally. I drive the car normally. Um, you know, I do run in eco mode 100%. Uh, so I, that I'm not really taking off super fast from Jackrabbit starts and that kind of stuff. But if I need the power, I can floor it and get that all that instant torque that I need to get out of a situation or to get up to speed pretty quick. So hopefully this information is helpful. Um, if other leaf owners want to share some information, uh, email me or put in some of the comments what they're seeing. I'd love to hear that from you as well. Just a quick mailbag here that I've got. Uh, haven't had. Well, I've had some emails on and off for the last couple of months, but does most of it's been stuff that just questions about a certain element of my leaf or something like that that I've been getting asked or people asking uh other things. So I've, I wanted to just throw this up. This was an email I got at the at near late November from Johan. Uh, Johan is in Amsterdam area and he at the time uh, had just come back from touring the Tesla Model 3 showroom in Amsterdam, in the center of Amsterdam, and he was enamored and blown away by the Model 3 that was there. Here's a few pictures behind me of him and his wife and the showroom that they went to visit. Um, they were very pleasantly surprised as to actually be able to be able to couldn't drive the car, obviously, but to sit behind the wheel, touch touch the interface, the tablet, see some of the, how the software works, feel the interior. Uh, just experience the car and you know that goes back to my point of before you buy a, an EV we're, we all have opinions on cars uh, and that goes with any car if you have an opportunity to at least go sit in it if you can't drive it worst case is at least go sit in it you know ergonomically how does it feel controls can is this something you can see yourself driving on a daily basis or so so it's very important to do that and as I mentioned now a month or so later, a month and a half later, um, the you know the ordering is all online in Europe and everything's way to go. But I, you know I appreciate emails like this, so thanks, uh, Johan, for sending me that email and the pictures. And I think that he's put yeah he's he's got his reservation for quite a long time, so he should be seeing his Model Three very soon. And Johan, when you do get your Model Three, send me a picture. I'd love to see it. All right, well, before I get to the end of the show, uh, I've got a lot of emails over the last couple of days saying, hey, what happened to the the, the raffle for the fundraiser? Uh, you didn't announce a winner or anything. Well, because I said I would announce it on the next show after you know the contest closes, which is this show here, episode 25. So I'm pleased to announce the winner of the um, charity fundraiser. Now, just to get, put some perspective, I, I thank everybody who uh, bought tickets. I really very much appreciate it. I sold 118 tickets. Um, and what I did is uh, Eventbrite lets you export that into a spreadsheet. And then for people that have multiple tickets, I just uh, ex you know added a line for each ticket that they bought. So somebody bought four, they had four rows on the spreadsheet. If they bought 10, they had 10 rows on the spreadsheet. And they were numbered from 1 to 118. Uh, from that uh, specific, uh, that's how I did that. So you know, every, so it was fair for everybody. And then I just went online and used a random number generator program to select a winner. And the winning number came out to a gentleman named Marcel. 
um, and Marcel Ward, if I've got that correct, and he lives in Surrey, United Kingdom. So it's kind of ironic that these bags came all the way from the UK to me, and now they're going back all the way to the UK. But congratulations, Marcel, for for uh, entering the for buying a ticket, for supporting the cause, and for winning. Now, what I wanted to do is 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 kind of pick another couple of numbers as well and send something out for the second and third place if you want to use that analogy. So uh, I picked a couple of extra numbers through the random generator and uh, the second place person was Gary from Toronto here. I won't say the last name, but uh, Gary, you're going to get um, the EV Revolution coffee mug and I'm going to uh, mail that out to you at some point uh, within the next week or so. And then the third place uh, person is Corey from Oakland, Michigan. Uh, Corey, you're going to get an EV Revolution show ball cap uh, that I showed uh, way back when. I'm going to send that out to you. I will reach out to both of you um, and um, let you know the specifics about how I'm going to get that to you with tracking information and all that. But again, congratulations to everybody for winning something and a heartfelt thank you for everybody who contributed. Um, after the shipping costs, and I'm going to top it up, uh, I, we're going to net about $500. That's going to go to the Hospital for Sick Kids Children's Foundation there. And I'm going to meet up with those folks in a couple of weeks when I'm downtown to present them a check and to uh, give them give them the money. So I want to thank everybody very much for, for helping me out. Uh, I may actually even throw in a few more bucks into that myself uh, and maybe bump it up to 550 or so. But uh, 500 was kind of the number I had floating in my head. I said, if I can get to that after shipping and all, all that stuff is done, um, I would be very happy with that. So I am extremely thrilled. So thank you, everybody who contributed to this. I will try to do some more fundraisers throughout 2019 or at least another one anyway at some point, and I'll keep everybody involved. But thank you, thank you, thank you for, uh, for helping me on that. And that's the end of the show. Here we go. So a little bit longer than probably normal, but I wanted to... Uh, uh, especially the Nissan specs, I thought was quite interesting as I was pulling them together. So hopefully that was valuable information. Now, I always want to hear back from you folks. So please email me at evrevolutionshow at gmail.com. That's how you can reach me there. Follow me on Twitter if you're not already. My Twitter handle is at evrevshow. And uh, of course, if you're watching this show on YouTube, you can subscribe. I'd very much appreciate your, subs uh, your subscribing to the channel. Uh, as I mentioned on a couple of shows ago, I'd like to see if I can get to 10,000 subscribers by the end of this year. I'm almost halfway there. Um, it's kind of a lofty goal, but hey, we'll see what happens. And uh, I would appreciate if you have not subscribed. If you could, you'll click the bell as well. You get notified of the shows when I push it up. Something new, I'm also on Instagram. So as of January 1st, I just launched my in Instagram account. Account, Yes, I'm finally getting into the 21st century, <laughs> slowly but surely. Appreciate everybody waiting for me on that. You can check me out at EV Revolution Show is the Instagram handle ID, so you can follow me on that. Um, I'm still doing the audio podcast. In fact, I have one uh, that I'll be taping this weekend and should go out sometime next week. Um, you can check those out. Uh, just search your podcast app, uh, your player that you have, whether it's through iTunes or Google Play. Search EV Revolution Show Audio Podcast and they'll come up. I'm also on Spotify, TuneIn Radio, and Stitcher as well. You can find them there. And as always, a big, I sound like a broken record every show, but I want to make sure I acknowledge my Patreon supporters. Um, it's truly general, you know, very genuine of you to support me. I appreciate it an awful lot. So thank you for supporting me. If you're not sure what Patreon is and you want to think about maybe supporting me through that, you can go to www.patreon.com forward slash EV Revolution Show and get the details on what that is all about. And on that note, I believe that's everything that I wanted to say for episode 25 of the EV Revolution Show. Um, I'll probably get another show out next week before I go to Detroit because I'm going to be going to Detroit and attending the North American International Auto Show on January the 14th. That's a Monday, so I'll be there. It's one of the media days, so I'll be there doing my thing, filming, and I'm excited because I'm hoping to see, well, I mean, I'm sure the, the new Nissan announcement, the E-Plus will come out before that, but hopefully maybe they'll have one there and I can check it out and see all the other new stuff. Uh, maybe Rivian might be there. Boy, I hope those guys have their truck there. I'd love to climb around that. But anyway, so that'll be coming out in a, in a couple of weeks, but uh, I should have a show for next week before that. So until then, please, everybody stay safe. Thank you very much for watching, and we'll see you next time. Uh -huh.